Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest in the series of the RAI's Reviewer Meets Reviewed uh, sessions. We should be in the uh, library of the, of the Anthropology Library of the British Museum, but of course, under current circumstances, uh, we're not. My name is Richard Farden, and I'm going to chair the meeting. Um, the format, which most of you will know already, but in case you're new to it, the format is that a book that has already been reviewed in the Journal of the Royal Anthropological Institute is first introduced by the author and then commented upon by the reviewer. And after that, we open things as quickly as we can for questions from everybody else. So if you have a question, uh, please put it in the, uh, the Q&A. And uh, if you want me to mention that the question is from a particular person, then please put your name on it. And if you don't want me to mention that, then obviously, don't. Anyway, uh, I'm an anthropologist, uh, an emeritus professor at the School of Oriental and African Studies, but strangely enough, I'm the only anthropologist amongst the three of us here uh, this afternoon. The author of the book, Philip Murphy, is, the, is Professor of British Commonwealth History in the University of London, and he's also Director of the Institute of Commonwealth uh, Studies in the School of Advanced Study at the University. Uh, this book came out in 2018. Um, there we are. I don't know if you can see it. And it was called the, the Empire's New Clothes. And just in case the new clothes bit didn't give you the message, the subtitle was The Myth of the Commonwealth. And in case you hadn't got the point after two nudges, the front cover shows 12 teacups Maybe he can tell us if there's any significance to there being 12, the last one of which is, is broken. So I think that gives you some sort of idea of the take that this very widely reviewed and commented upon book uh, uh, took on the, on the uh, Commonwealth. So it's two years ago, so we can also ask him whether he still feels the same now as he felt when he was writing the book and it, whether anything has moved on and changed uh, since. Uh, the reviewer who I have to say gave it a very favorable review is Professor Justin uh, Willis of, and he's a historian who works at the University of uh, Durham. He was previously director of the British Institute in, uh, in East Africa. So has a fair degree of uh, familiarity with Commonwealth countries himself, having uh, lived out there as director of the British Institute in East Africa. And uh, some of you may be interested in his writings as well. For instance, he has a, a history of alcohol in East Africa, which is, uh, a warming subject for a winter's evening. Anyway, with no more ado, what I'm going to do now is hand over to Philip, ask him to tell us about the uh, book, and he will then hand over to Justin. And when we've done with that, I'll come back and we can open the uh, discussion. We're hoping as far as possible for this not to be too much of a just two talking heads but rather talking heads in conversation with one another so we'll try and do it relatively informally and see how it goes so thanks for your attention thanks for coming and hope you find this enjoyable thank you very much richard and i'm i'm very grateful to the rai for inviting me to talk about my book and for uh justin uh to agree to to take part as as well and for his very kind review um let me give you a little bit of background about the book and, and tell you how it came to be written. Um, as Richard mentions, I'm the director of the Institute of Commonwealth Studies at the School of Advanced Study, at the University of London. And I took over as director over 10 years ago now in 2009. And I'd come from uh, being in a kind of conventional history department uh, at the University of Reading for about 12 years. I was a historian really of, of decolonization, British colonial um, and, and foreign policy. Um, and so the, you know, the first big question on, on arriving at the Institute was what am I supposed to be doing? What is, I mean, it seemed to be quite straightforward what a director of the Institute of Historical Research or Classical Studies should be doing, but what, what exactly is Commonwealth Studies? And so the other, um, the other steep learning curve was that I was familiar with the Commonwealth as a, as a historical entity, 
and I suppose particularly in its uh, the kind of the early years of the new Commonwealth in the in the sort of sixties seventies, um, but had only a kind of passing familiarity with the the contemporary Commonwealth, and and was suddenly being asked, well, what do you think as director of the Institute of Commonwealth Studies about what the Commonwealth should do about X, Y, or Z, and so. They came, you know, they, they, I underwent some process of meeting lots of people, starting to observe the Commonwealth as a, a fly on the wall, if you like. And I suppose the more I looked, the more bemused I became and uh, the more frustrated I became. And, and I think that bemusement and frustration with the Commonwealth is a fairly common phenomenon. You know, there's that famous uh, uh, line attributed, I think wrongly attributed to, to Einstein, that insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And it seemed to me that the, the standard British approach to the Commonwealth had an awful lot of that. British ministers, British political leaders, seem to kind of expect the Commonwealth suddenly to deliver tangible results um, without any real evidence that it had done so in, in earlier years, certainly since the 1960s and certainly in terms of, of British foreign policy interests. So what was, what, what is this thing? Why does it still have such a kind of grasp over the, the British political popular imagination. Does it have any, any um, sort of significant buy-in elsewhere in, in, in the world? Um, and so uh, what you kind of saw, I suppose, was someone arriving fresh-faced at the Institute in 2009 and, and, and wanting to be friends with everyone. And I suppose slowly becoming more disillusioned and more, more jaded um, through a series of stages, really. And one could, could sort of mention two or three of those. The first in, in 2011, so only two years in, which was actually witnessing my first Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, going all the way to Perth in Western Australia to do that and seeing the extraordinarily inept, it seemed to me, way in which a major process of institutional reform within the, the Commonwealth was handled. An eminent persons group was, was um, set up. Um, it produced a report. Uh, the report was supposed to be published ahead of the meeting. It wasn't, it was leaked. Everyone had it. Um, uh, it became a bit of a joke that although it was supposedly secret, everyone had read it. And um, in the end, its most important recommendation that there should be appointed a commissioner for uh, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law, really to police so-called Commonwealth values, was simply pushed into the long grass. Um, uh, and, and one had this, this really rather kind of soggy compromise coming, coming out of that. And I remember sort of sitting in, those of you who know Perth, know this huge park, St. George's Park, sort of wilderness, sitting there with my little laptop, sort of typing madly, rather angrily, typing out this article, which eventually I managed to place in the kind of Australian version of the Spectator magazine. Really, it, talking about what a, how farcical the whole experience had been, how strange the whole experience had been. The next step, I suppose, 2013, was when I suppose the, 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 the farce became slightly more sinister. And that's that one saw what, what apparently was a moribund organization, um, floating rather rudderless, being taken over, being commandeered by a member state with a not particularly 
attractive human rights record. That's the government of Sri Lanka. Um, and one was aware that the government of Sri Lanka had lobbied very, very hard indeed to be given the right to host the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in 2013, partly because it's, it's the country's president, President Rajapaksa, who was uh, accused in, in many quarters by some very powerful, two very powerful um, uh, Channel 4 documentaries of uh, whose regime was was accused of being associated with human rights abuses during the Sri Lankan civil war. Rajapaksa then became the Commonwealth's chair in office. And uh, the um, if the British government didn't know how to use the Commonwealth for its own diplomatic purposes, the Sri Lankan government certainly did. And the Sri Lankan High Commissioner in, in, in London worked very hard to get onto the boards uh, of some of the major Commonwealth organizations in London. And it had a bit of a chilling effect. Very few people seem to be prepared to speak out um, against what seemed to be a very unwise development for an organization that claimed to be organized around the defense of human rights and, and democracy. Um, and also in 2013, I brought out uh, an earlier book, which was actually, a, it was a more conventional study of monarchy and, and the Commonwealth. And it seemed to me that, um, again, although one might expect the role of uh, the royal family to become less significant as the Commonwealth developed, in a sense, it was becoming more significant because the Commonwealth was really so, so lacking in, in other issues that were newsworthy except the, these occasional scandals, that the, the presence of the Queen in a, in a Commonwealth-related story was, the, was really the only thing the press were ever interested in when it came to Commonwealth affairs. And I, you know, I, I came out with this phrase, which I think Valentine Lowe wrote up in the Times, and it was when I was feeling very kind of depressed about what was happening in 2013, around Sri Lanka, that whereas a New Zealand prime minister had said that uh, monarchy was the, or I think he'd said the queen was the glue that held the Commonwealth together. I said increasingly she seems to be the glue that keeps this particular dead parrot upright on its perch. Um, and that I, I, in some quarters, I think I've never quite been forgiven for that. Um, uh, particular phrase, although I kind of repeat it in the book. Um, I, so I was kind of also, you know, I suppose gradually becoming slightly persona non grata amongst certain circles within the Commonwealth as I became more critical of it. Um, and then 2016, there was the Brexit referendum and a suggestion that this, this organization, um, that seemed to be, uh, you know, such a, a sort of hollowed out international body could be some sort of alternative to the EU in terms of British political and, and particularly economic interests. It seemed to me so absurd that I suppose that that really sort of pushed me into writing, writing the book. And I, I did so partly, you know, just, during the summer of 2016, um, I wrote a kind of early draft of the introduction and sent it to a friend who liked it and then sent a proposal to Michael Dwyer at Hearst. And Michael uh, took up the, the proposal and Hearst did a wonderful job. I mean, I really, you know, I, I have nothing but praise for the way that they produced the book and marketed it and their faith in me to, to actually write it. And it was written, I suppose, very quickly, the bulk of it in 2017 and came out in 2018. And so what you have just very briefly is an introduction, a sort of meditation on the nature of the Commonwealth, why it seems so fascinating to fascinating to some people and, and so mysterious to others. Um, 
a chapter really sort of setting out the Commonwealth family because the, it really consists of a, a, a variety of different organizations. Um, a chapter looking at its record, what it has achieved, what its value was in the past, and drawing on um, a major project which the Institute um, undertook, the Commonwealth Oral History Project, um, a series of interviews with leading figures in the Commonwealth um, conducted by my colleague Sue Onslow with tremendous skill. Uh, so over 70 interviews with prime ministers, foreign ministers across the Commonwealth. And I, I, we've added a link to that in the chat. So if you'd like to see some of that raw material, I think those, those interviews are really valuable. Um, those chats on monarchy, really looking at, um, I suppose, why that link with the crown had continued to uh, survive, particularly in the so-called Commonwealth realms where the queen is head of state. A chat on which I call guilt, which is about the elephant in the room with the, in, in terms of the Commonwealth, that the, the legacies of empire and the fact that the Commonwealth arose out of the British Empire. And I'm happy to talk about that a little bit more because it's over the last couple of years, I think it's become a more prominent theme in discourse around the Commonwealth. A chat on values, the, the, the attempt from the 1990s to re, reconfigure the Commonwealth really as a values-based organization and the, the extent to which that had been successful. The, the Sri Lanka affair um, and the events around 2013, and then Brexit, and the, the debates around Brexit in the Commonwealth, um, and uh, a rather terse conclusion. Um, before I sort of uh, hand over to, to, to Justin, just to say that I take full responsibility for um, everything in the book, except the title, which I can't claim full responsibility for, um, because as, as often happens with, with a book, it had, it had various working titles for quite a long time, not, none of which were entirely satisfactory. And then I was talking to uh, our Institute manager, Chloe Peters, uh, who is also uh, a, 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 a academic working on a PhD at, at, at the moment. And um, we, were, we were having some conversation about some package that the, the Institute might or might not buy, but seemed to us pretty expensive. And uh, then we started to joke, well, you know, think of the quality, you know, think of the fabric. So, uh, and uh, Chloe said, yeah, like the empire, I mean, the emperor's new clothes. And I said, stop, stop, the empire's new clothes, that's, that's it. And of course, you know the, the, the story of the emperor, the emperor's new clothes, the, the vain emperor who is conned by two uh, villains um, who tell him that they've made the most wonderful and sumptuous and expensive suit of clothes for him, but only truly wise people can see it. So the emperor, of course, pays them and pretends to see this wonderful suit of clothes and all the courtiers who don't want to be thought of as stupid say how wonderful it is but there's nothing there and i it seems to me one way of kind of reading the, the 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 commonwealth not just that it was an empire that took on a new garb um but that that garb was is essentially insubstantial and that that is why you know, it's so often disappointed the hopes that have been placed in it. And the myth is the, the myth of something for nothing, um, that one might love or hate the European Union, but it was, in a sense, the, the, the product of decades and decades of hard negotiation and compromise and legislation. Um, the Commonwealth was a result of none of this. Um, it's very much the result of centrifugal forces, of dissolution, um, and that there is very little there as a result. Now that's not the final word about the Commonwealth, but it is a, a good way of understanding uh, 
why it's so often disappointed, you know, disappointed the hopes that have been placed in it. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, thank you, Philip. And um, th those of you who've been listening will uh, recognise that tone if you read the the book. It's not a, it's not a, it's an informative read. It's a provocative read, but it isn't written in an academic style that makes it a taxing uh, read. It's it's an enjoyable read. So. Uh, Justin, are you still? Yes, hello. <laughs> so um, I've read your review, but um, not everyone will have done. So um, please respond. Um, I'm probably gonna respond partly um, by way of asking questions as much as anything else, because in some ways my review um, is so full of enthusiasm that there's not very much point in repeating it. I, I read the book with some delight, partly because I've always shared the bemusement that Philip describes when considering the Commonwealth. I've always wondered what on earth this is for, and I've been puzzled and baffled, really, by the way that people talk about it, and especially when people talk about it in ways that suggest that it's somehow kind of enormously significant in its ability to do things. So I, I, I read the book with enthusiasm and enjoyment, not just because it's well written, but also, I suspect, because my prejudices inclined me to enjoy reading it. So I, I won't kind of say at length what my review says, but I would like to talk through a few questions with Philip, which I think are maybe kind of interesting for the audience and may help us to think a little bit more about the book. And I think the starting point for my questions would really be something that Philip touched on in terms of a catalyst for writing the book, which is the referendum. And I wondered, Philip, if, the referendum had gone the other way, would you still have written the book? Because while it is clearly sort of driven partly by your bafflement and annoyance at, at the Commonwealth itself, it's also driven, I think, particularly by, by a degree of, well, rage, I suppose, almost, at the way that the Commonwealth was, in your view, and I, I think I would agree with this view, misused and misrepresented during the campaign. So if the Leave vote had lost, would you have cared so much? Um, I, I might not have, it, it, it might not have provided the necessary catalyst, but that book was, as I'd suggested, was sort of brewing in me for, for a long time. Um, and, and, and in a way it, um, it, it provides the final sort of, I, I suppose, chapter of folly uh, from from my point of view, the Brexit referendum, um, to add to the, the previous chapters of, of folly, I suppose. Um, I, I became quite, I mean, you know, I suppose, um, like most academics I know, um, and uh, the few uh, who did support Brexit, most, most didn't. I was um, involved in this outfit called Historians for Britain in Europe, um, which was um, sort of campaigning insofar as we did anything very much at all, except establish a website, you know, um, for Britain to remain in Europe at the time of the um, uh, referendum. And um, we had a we had a nice Facebook page, and I remember sort of very proudly putting it up. And my sister, rather cynically, writing back, "Oh, that'll swing it." And of course, she was she was entirely right. Um, you know, experts were not being you know we were precisely the sort of bunch of experts that no one wanted to listen to really uh, at that time. But, but all, you know, in, in, in the process, I suppose I started to do a, a bit of kind of serious background research on the nature of the Commonwealth's, you know, the, the economic significance of the Commonwealth to Britain, um, the nature of Commonwealth trade. Um, and, and it had become, I think, Interestingly, from, from the 1990s, um, the idea that part of the potential of the Commonwealth was to boost trade between member states. And, and 
peculiarly, that, that particular heresy had arisen uh, as a consequence of the, you know, of Tony Blair being elected in 1997. I mean, there, there, there'd been some, there was a, an, an article in the round table in about 1995 suggesting that there was some sort of, com, you know, Commonwealth trade advantage. Um, I don't know how seriously anyone would have taken that. Um, it wasn't particularly well substantiated. Um, but when when Blur comes into power in 1987, um, the only real way they can see any relevance in the Commonwealth anymore is, is, a, is a way of boosting trade. And we, one can now see that the, the cabinet minutes from that that um, the early months of the Blair administration and Robin Cook briefing the cabinet ahead of the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in, uh, in Edinburgh in 97, saying it's, it's gonna be all about boosting British trade. This is what the Commonwealth is about now. And so that this sort of myth arose of a Commonwealth advantage in trade, um, that if only Britain could sort of realign would, would, they would benefit from this. And of course that gets, that gets deployed in, in the Commonwealth debates. And it, 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 it seemed to me another example of, of, of in, in Britain suffering from its own delusions around, around the Commonwealth in a very specific way. Um, so, so I think it, it, it all helped to kind of propel the book, the book forward and the book out and, and sort of probably added to the, the anger behind it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I wanted to also to ask you a little bit more. You distinguish, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think you have a slightly different view towards different kinds of Commonwealth enthusiasts. Mm. There are some who you describe in the book as the true believers with mm. a capital T and a capital B, yeah. who I, I think you have a sort of kind of slightly fond of you of as misled, genuinely believing in this mythical creature, um, genuinely believing that at some stage it will kind of appear from its mysterious mm. lair and be something more yeah. than it actually really is. Um, do you think there are many true believers left out there? And if there are, are they a dying breed these days? There, there, there are some. I mean, I, I was probably a bit mean about, about without kind of naming names, but, but, but sort of identifying a particular type. And, and you sort of, you, you know who your friends are when times get tough. And um, uh, of course in October, the, the School of Advanced Study announced that it, it planned to close the Institute of Commonwealth Studies. And there was a, there was a fight back. And, and actually, uh, all of those Commonwealth organizations rallied around and, and uh, you know, on, on the whole, uh, defended us. So I, you know, uh, the, uh, there is a kind of, um, you know, I, I, feel, I feel mean now, uh, slightly, about, about having made fun of some of the attitudes there. But it did strike me that it, it was a little bit like a kind of a religion uh, for some people. And, and, and often there are people who'd been, worked in the Commonwealth Secretariat and uh, for, had, had been around the, the Commonwealth for decades. And there was almost a private language, these particular acronyms that, that, are, that are used and, and a, a, a real sense that it, you know, it, it was something profoundly valuable which would, would show its worth um, if only it was allowed to do so. And if only there was kind of, there was any sort of faith in its ability to do so. So that, that actually pointing out problems, pointing out failures was in some ways um, disloyal. Um, and, and I think it's very important to say that that was, that, Although that might be misguided, and I think it probably is misguided in some in some cases, it comes from a good place. I think, for, again, for people who don't know that that world, Commonwealth enthusiasm is sometimes confused with imperial nostalgia, and that was not the case. I mean, 
these were people who were with the Commonwealth in its kind of glory days of battling apartheid. Um, when, when the Commonwealth was led by this extraordinarily charismatic group of independence leaders. And it seemed to be a really exciting place to be because it was on the kind of progressive cutting edge. And it was precisely because it was anti-imperial and it wasn't reactionary. And I think that that, that is the vision that they, they embraced. But I think that, that that moment has gone and, and that what has sort of given it, what gave it that sense of momentum is probably impossible to recapture now under, under current circumstances. So I think that, that, that you know, what, what, it, it was sometimes frustrating um, to be amongst people like that, because I'm not by nature a person of faith. I, I'm, I'm sort of a skeptic. Uh, and I think that there is a kind of, there is a morality of skepticism, which is, is about puncturing illusion, which I think is, is generally a, a, a good thing. But I, I don't think, I, you know, I think that people believed in the organization for very, very well-meaning reasons. Um, and, um, and that's quite different, I think, from the opportunists who jumped on the, the notion of the Commonwealth as a way of, you know, promoting a kind of disaster capitalism, um, a very different sort of, you know, uh, advocates of the organization. Which kind of leads me on to sort of, okay, so for those opportunists, which, who again, you kind of excoriate very successfully in the book, so now, you know, they got what they wanted. The mm. United Kingdom has left the European Union. Yeah. Um, do they still need the mythical creature or are they going to kind of now forget about it and go off to think about something else? That is, do any of those opportunists still care about the Commonwealth now, now all the Brexit stuff is over? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, 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 don't, think, I don't think they ever did care about it very much. Um, you know, I mean, Johnson, Boris Johnson's own pronouncements in print about the Commonwealth, I'm not going to repeat them because they're too odious, you know, in, in the past, the way that um, the sort of racial epithets he sometimes applied to his, uh, his fun games about, about the Commonwealth. Um, that, you know, that, and, and actually, again, many of the people who were, who did believe very passionately in it, um, were, were either Remainers or kind of sat, sat on, on, on the fence um, in, in, in the referendum campaign. Um, you know, the, 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 the attempts that were made by UKIP to, to push the, the Commonwealth forward into the debate, you know, suggestions in, I think, the 2015 um, party manifesto that there could be a Commonwealth free trade area, I mean, forgetting the fact that um, two Commonwealth countries, two other Commonwealth countries, um, Malta and, and, and Cyprus, were also EU, EU members. Um, there, there was never any real, there was never a sort of serious engagement around the Commonwealth in that way, never a joined up engagement. It was more mood, mood music. So, our, you know, our Commonwealth friends will always be there for us. No, no more detail than that. Um, and, and of course, for the, there, there's always a sort of a paradox there for the sort of the, the power light right, um, because Powell was one of the most effective critics of the Commonwealth mm -hmm. in, on the British political stage. And, and of course, famously derided it as a gigantic farce uh, in an anonymous um, article in the Times in 1964. And, and uh, going, you know, for, from that, uh, of course, there were two other, two very prominent strands. Firstly, in the campaign against 
white minority rule in uh, Rhodesia and South Africa, the, the power light right largely took the, 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 the position of the white settlers against the, com the dominant Commonwealth position. And on the question of immigration, Commonwealth became associated with non-white immigration. So in a sense, the, the, the kind of right wing that rallied behind Brexit uh, had been alienated from the Commonwealth as it existed from the 1960s and was suddenly trying to fall back in love with it without really knowing what it was. And so they, of course, they kind of tried to change the, you know, the definition of what it was to the Anglosphere. So this kind of fantasy of uh, UK, uh, New Zealand, Canada, Australia, um, when you see articles in the Daily Telegraph um, called, you know, Commonwealth, Commonwealth will be our salvation. What 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 it invariably is talking about is is those, you know, three or four countries, rather than the Commonwealth as it exists of, of 53, 54 uh, member states around the world. So th there's a there's a very uneasy relationship there, I think. Um, and not surprising that it's never really been the basis of a of a serious engagement. Mm -hmm. Which makes it sound as though you think there's not, not going to be any kind of ongoing political investment in this from those who were most prominent in the Brexit campaign who are now running the country. And so their interest in the Commonwealth is, is largely behind or, or might be in reinventing it as sort of the five eyes kind of as, yeah, as a trade version. I, I mean, uh, yeah, and, and I, think, I think Johnson, even when he was mayor of London, was starting to talk in those terms about a kind of free free movement area, um, and and that's that's the version of the Commonwealth that really appeals to uh, the, the the sort of right wing Brexiteers. Um, um, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which I suppose then kind of comes on to, an, and uh, you'll probably be hesitant to do this, we are both historians, therefore we are mm. reluctant to predict the future. But of course I have to ask, and I think probably the audience will be interested mm. in to know your views on this, what is going to happen since you have described this as a, as a monarch, as a, an institution held to its perch only by, by a monarch who um, is quite elderly, yeah. um, what is going to happen in the next 10 years? What will the Commonwealth be in 10 years time? Would you care to speculate on that for us? Well, uh, I mean, on, on one hand, the, the and this is a sort of significant development, although I, I, I kind of uh, sort of predicted it in the book. Um, at the 2018 Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in, in London, finally, the Commonwealth um, confirmed that Charles would be the next head of the Commonwealth uh, uh, after the Queen dies, assuming that Charles is still alive then. Um, uh, and, and before then, um, it, the issue had been avoided, um, uh, except at a sort of a rather secret level that arrangements were made to you know, gather together you know, after, after the Queen died, um, arrangements would be made for Commonwealth High Commissioners to get together and be consulted. And, and you can see actually in the files, the National Archives, these discussions going on really from the 60, 1960s onwards. Um, because the, the position of head of the Commonwealth wasn't really regarded as even a, a proper ceremonial role. So no thought was given as to whether it would be hereditary or, or whether it might pass to a, a non-royal. And, and, and there wasn't much appetite for kind of confronting that head on. But finally, after a lot of lobbying from the palace, um, it, it was decided that it, this, this had to be kind of sorted out. 
ahead of the Queen's death, and that was done. So when the Queen dies, Charles will be head of the, the Commonwealth, and he will be sovereign of 16 Commonwealth realms, which is a completely different thing. Um, because um, across the realms, that would be entirely up to the people of those countries themselves, whether they want to retain the monarchy or not. And nothing is, you know, I mean, there were some rumblings last year that Barbados might be in the process of moving towards Republican status. And it might, it might do within the next year or so, partly because it's constitutionally easier for Barbados to make that move than a lot of other states because the, there aren't constitutional hurdles to, to be overcome. You just need a, a vote in the two houses of the parliament. Whereas in Jamaica, for example, you need a referendum as well to change the constitution in that way. So even if, even if Barbados goes Republican, it's not necessarily gonna start uh, a rush for the door. And in Canada, for example, it's virtually impossible to do. Um, you, you'd need a, um, a majority, not just in the federal parliament, but in all the provincial assemblies as well to get rid of the queen. So one way or another, that royal link is, is likely to be there for some time to come. Um, and it, it is, you know, it, it's the thing that draws leaders. The, the monarchy, ha, you know, this phrase, it has, it has convening power. And there have been times in the past when a, a British prime minister wouldn't have gone to an overseas Commonwealth heads of government meeting, except that the Queen was going to be there. And, and it was very notable that when the meeting took place in London at Buckingham Palace in 2018, far more heads of state, far more leaders attended than had done for the last two or three. Um, so it's still, you know, people turn out for the Queen. Uh, and so it's important. So the monarchy will will keep on playing its role, but then what else will the Commonwealth keep doing? Um, one of the interesting things you did in the book, I, I thought, was to show mm. how at different moments, the Commonwealth has been a kind of handy tool for a whole series of different actors to do yeah. political work, which was essential to them at that particular yeah. moment. And it's, it's like a tool that gets sort of picked down and used, picked up, used a bit, then put down and somebody else picks it up. So quite apart then from the question of the monarchy and how that might play a role in perpetuating the Commonwealth, who else might find it useful? Because there is surely a point at which this is, this kind of international tool will be of diminishing use to anyone. Or, yeah. or maybe not. I think that there was, it, it's, it's, um, it's easy to forget this, but I think it was, I think the Cold War gave the Commonwealth particular importance. Mm. Certainly from a British political point of view, um, that it was a way of keeping avenues of communication and, and a sort of a sense of fraternity, if you like, to countries that might otherwise be leaning quite heavily towards the Soviet Union, as, as India did at various times. Um, and, um, you know, I, I interviewed one um, Indian for, former foreign secretary who was talking about how that, you know, the Soviet, Soviet diplomats used to make fun of the Indians, saying, yeah, still kind of doing that Commonwealth nonsense, are you? And he was having to explain why it was still, you know, still saw some value in it. Um, but, but I think that, that that was actually quite, quite important in, in, in a Cold War setting. Um, and of course, what, what most uh, of the newer Commonwealth members picked up on was this mission to, uh, to continue the process of decolonization where it had stalled in Southern Africa. And it became a kind of a visceral cause. It was like a kind of a body reclaiming a missing limb. You know, it was, it was as deep as that. And you, so that paradoxically, although 
the, the establishment of majority rule in South Africa in the mid 90s was a victory of sorts for the Commonwealth who'd kept that issue in the, in the headlines. It deprived it of its signature issue. And there's been nothing really to replace it. If you ask, you know, a group of Commonwealth enthusiasts, um, if you ask 10 Commonwealth enthusiasts, you know, should there be a, a, a focus on one or two issues? They all say yes, but they'll tell you 30 different issues that it should, it should be. Um, and the question is, what is the, it, for what, for what sort of, for what problem is the Commonwealth a logical framework for a solution? And it was over Southern Africa and, and apartheid, but it isn't over climate change. I mean, climate change or gender equality um, or maritime pollution, they're all very good issues, but there's no reason why it, the, the solution could come through 53 states, which happen to be former members of the British Empire on the, on the whole. So what are, what are the issues? Maybe, maybe democracy and open societies, because what the Commonwealth is, is a really fascinating laboratory for the way in which versions of the Westminster system have or haven't bedded down. Um, so that maybe things like that, but again, it hasn't really had the teeth to enforce its values in, in those respects. Um, so, so the question remains, what is it, what is it for? And I don't, I don't see that answer appearing on the horizon anytime soon. Hmm. Yeah, um, and certainly with respect to democracy, I, I mean, the Commonwealth's attempt to sort of reinvent itself as an, an organization that did election monitoring and democracy, <laughs> yeah. as you show in the book, partly kind of falls down because it's deliberately kind of pushed away by some member states, but also it's taken up with more energy and enthusiasm by other organizations. I mean, the, the EU has now kind of left yeah. the Commonwealth in the dust as far as election observation goes. And yes. Commonwealth missions now revolve very much around the kind of their sort of jollies for senior people as, as mm. far as I can tell that may sound a bit unkind of me but the phrase you used earlier in the, your talk about eminent persons mm. does seem to sort of reflect the pattern of the commonwealth observation mission and much else that the commonwealth does these are sort of social events for a relatively small group of people who know one another through these things so yeah yeah is there really a role for this and I, I'm inclined to kind of share your skepticism on that by the yeah. way, an anecdote for you, if, yeah. if you don't mind me indulging yeah. myself, like speaking to a kind of a foreign office audience on matters of democracy a couple of years ago, I was absolutely dumbstruck to receive a question from the audience of diplomats saying, what is the relevance of the Commonwealth? Mm. And I thought, well, I'm just amazed to be asked that question because I thought you guys all knew that it doesn't have one. Uh, and I wasn't quite sure what to make of this. Um, uh, I was just, I, I was surprised that they didn't share my skepticism, I suppose. Perhaps that means my skepticism is wrong. And perhaps it does have more leverage amongst the diplomatic and other community than I expect. But I must say, I was, I was baffled by that question about what is the role of the Commonwealth here? Because I genuinely couldn't see one. And I was surprised that anyone thought there might be one. But maybe that's I some think, kind I of... Think it, yeah, it, it actually it benefits from that mystique the fact that very few people know the ins and outs of it and therefore assume that there must be something more substantial there than there actually is. And, you know, there have been kind of debate, as with most, most sort of waning and aging organisations, it tends to fetishise youth engagement of various sorts, as though holding, you know, uh, meetings with so-called youth representatives and special conferences and seminars is, is, is really going to kind of enthuse young people. And I, I've often said, not entirely, uh, not entirely as a joke, that um, if, you, if you just kind of did everything in complete secrecy, 
you had a kind of regular meeting of Commonwealth heads on a vol volcanic island somewhere in the Pacific, and they were, you know, press were banned. And, um, you know, it was known that the Queen was there and, and Trudeau and Johnson and so forth. But um, no, no, no indication, everyone was sworn to secrecy. Um, you know, you would have millions of teenagers across the world telling you that in, in, in blogs that the Commonwealth sort of secretly ordered the affairs of the world, like, you know, kind of, and, and actually that there was a, a, a brief attempt to create a kind of Commonwealth Bilderberg group in uh, which, which the Duke of Edinburgh and Louis Mountbatten were involved in, in the mid sixties, at a time when the British were just getting getting bored with being in the dock the whole time and being attacked for being imperialists. Um, uh, Prince Philip and, and, and Mountbatten were invited to a couple of meetings of Bilderberg and they, they came up with this project that maybe that's, that's the way to do it, do it all in secrecy. And, um, but, but I, I, again, I think that that is a kind of, that is a sort of British secret weapon the fact that people think, okay, well, Britain's got the Commonwealth and it must be doing, must be doing something behind the scenes. Um, so maybe, maybe we shouldn't disillusion them. Now that seems a good moment. To, <laughs> Philip, Justin, we've had the first hour, which usually is taken up with the presentation and, and response. Yeah. Um, let me, there aren't an awful lot of questions around yet, but let me summarize some of the ones uh, we've got. Um, the, well, I'll put it into a, put it into a, a context. The, the, the book is interesting because it looks at by an anthropologist. You've got various things that anthropologists do. There's a quite a high level of reflexivity in it so that we learn quite a lot about you as we learn about your developing views on the Commonwealth and where you've come from mm. and why you might particularly have got the hump about some things rather than, than others. Mm. Uh, we learn about the, uh, an oral history project which is something an anthropological audience can uh, uh, you know, engage with. And we know about myths and symbols and so forth. Um, one of our questioners whose second name I'm afraid I can't read, I know it's Mike, but the, uh, the chat box has truncated the rest of the uh, surname, asks about popular engagement or evidence of popular engagement on the part of people who aren't, as it were, in the central circles of the uh, Commonwealth, and that got me thinking about um, you know, cultural exchange and sporting exchange and those things which are you know, Anglophony as opposed to yeah. Francophony for countries like, Mo well, Mozambique, of course, was Lusophone, but, but yeah. um, Cameroon and so forth, Joe Rwanda joining up with the Commonwealth. How do you feel about the um, evidence for any enthusiasm about participation in the broader, you know, broadly cultural uh, fellow feeling amongst people who have uh, belonged to an Anglophone culture, or at least an officially Anglophone culture in many instances. Yeah, it's, I, I mean, again, um, I think that uh, Francophonie has been far more um, upfront about promoting sort of common cultural values and the, and the language. Um, and, and of course, what, what, what complicates things, I suppose, is the, you know, the, the tremendous gravitational pull of American culture um, and, and the USA culturally, that it, it becomes difficult to kind of differentiate some sort of, some sort of commonwealth Commonwealth Anglophone sort of culture. Mm. Um, I mean, the the of course you have the Commonwealth Games. Uh, that's uh, takes place every every four years, and it's probably the the Commonwealth institution that most people know about and know most about and 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 notice. And it's it's taking place in Birmingham in in. 2022. Again, you know, I, I think that there may be some interesting cultural events around it. Um, 
and again, opportunities to, to think about the Commonwealth, rethink the Commonwealth. I, I think in terms of popular engagement, one of the, uh, okay, the, there's a way in which the Commonwealth, I suppose, has been reconfigured or, 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 or reconceptualized in, in recent years by David Howell, um, former Tory minister, uh, and Cameron's, um, Cameron appointed him as Minister of State in the Foreign Office in the coalition government. And how um, really had this, he published a book, I think in 2013, um, which again, Commonwealth enthusiasts really um, latched onto because um, Howell said, look, you know, you've seen the, the, the failure of conventional great power politics in, in Iraq and Af Afghanistan, seen this kind of post-Cold War hubris um, coming unstuck. W what, what is really gonna matter in the, in the future is networks. We, we, we live in a networked world and the Commonwealth has unparalleled networks. And in a sense that is, that is true Although that, you know, many of those networks are declining networks, mm -hmm. and uh, they the assumption is that people will engage with the Commonwealth as civil society through a series of civil society organisations, and there are dozens of them, from the sort of Commonwealth Boxing Association to Commonwealth Dentists, Commonwealth Golfers. It, it's that's great, but it's a sort of slightly old fashioned corporatist way of conceptualizing popular engagement. Um, but, but maybe, you know, I mean, the, uh, again, in this sort of strange COVID, post COVID world, we've all been learning to, to I suppose, make the best of things. Um, those of us who are in the, you know, the, the uh, the lucky position of being healthy and and, and um, uh, solvent, um, and my institute, the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, has started putting on events through this medium, through through web seminars, through Zoom, and really we're you know reaching unprecedented audiences. We're able to con genuinely connect scholars around the world in the way that we could never have afforded to do in, in old fashioned conferences. And so maybe there, is, there are new opportunities here for, for a, a different sort of popular engagement and particularly, you know, again, youth, youth engagement, um, but they've got to be the issues to actually, to organize around. I have questions coming from a rather different angle to do with the more with the political aspects of the Commonwealth. There are two that maybe you could take together because they might be related. One is to do with the um, significance that the Commonwealth might have for smaller nations, which otherwise yeah. don't have much heft and maybe don't have the same networks that the larger members of the Commonwealth might have. And related to, to that, does the Commonwealth have a significance um, looked at both ways uh, in terms of Britain's permanent seat on the UN Security uh, Council, uh, but particularly in the sense that Commonwealth countries might look to get some purchase and representation through Britain on the uh, Security Council. I mean, uh, this, it reminds me that in the, in the book, you had um, uh, you noted the disappointment of some Commonwealth countries that the UK was no longer in the EU, yeah. Uh, partly because, of course, Commonwealth countries already had trade agreements, or some of them with the EU, quite outside a Commonwealth framework, but also because the the uh, Britain being in the uh, EU gave the Commonwealth some representation uh, towards that body, and I suppose something similar might go for the UN Security Council. Yeah, I, I mean the. Um, Sir Peter Marshall very famously described the Commonwealth as the the aftercare service of the British Empire, mm -hmm. and and uh, you know the majority of the states that the British Empire left behind are small states. 
um, uh, with you know populations of one and a half million people or less. And, and certainly for those states, the Commonwealth is, is important um, because it, it allows them a place, uh, an equal place at the table in, with major international gatherings. Um, you know, the, the, uh, and not just small states, but I mean, um, places like Burundi, places like Southern Sudan, which have expressed an interest in joining. Um, and, you know, if, if, if one was the head of a small or uh, relatively poor, relatively unstable state, one would definitely want to join the Commonwealth if possible, because it is part of shoring up the stability of the state to have that international recognition and status on, on the international scene. And it, the Commonwealth, you know, Climate change does have a disproportionate impact on small island states, and small island states have been vocal in, in using the Commonwealth to push the sort of agenda on climate change. Um, and, you know, so, and it, it, it means that if there was, if there was a coup, someone overthrew you, there would at least be, you know, some organisation in the world that would give a damn about it in, in the Commonwealth Secretariat uh, and would lobby on your, on your behalf. Um, so um, I think that the, the problem is that the, at the same time, what, you know, I suppose in the sort of this, you know, 70s, um, that there was, wasn't such a variety of organizations to join. I think increasingly, you know, there are significant regional organizations, ECOWAS, CARICOM, um, you know, Pacific Island states, um, which perhaps provide a more coherent voice for some of those interests. Um, so that in that respect, the Commonwealth has lost some of its value to those states. But I think it still is valuable and it's worth, it's worth looking at the Commonwealth through, uh, from that perspective rather than necessarily from London's perspective. Philip, and, and, well, I've caught you in a positive frame of mind about yeah. the Commonwealth uh, yeah, uh, there. Yeah. And Justin as well, please do pitch in with this one. Uh, Terence Dormer has yeah. been asking whether some balance will be introduced into the conversation by inviting somebody who's in favour of the Commonwealth to pop up on the screen. I'm afraid that's not how the uh, Reviewer Meets Reviewed uh, sessions are, are um, uh, organised um, and it will be difficult to do at this point. So what I'll have to do is ask the two of you to, if you could, uh, ventriloquise a positive case for the, what's the best positive case you can both make for the uh, um, Commonwealth in the absence of someone else being here to make it for us. Okay, well, look, for, uh, you could say for, for start that if, particularly if the, the major donor countries were prepared to put money into the Secretariat, it would be able to do far more. I mean, it's it, from, from the 1990s onwards, it was suffering significant cuts and, and successive Commonwealth Secretary Generals have tried to make the case uh, for building up its resources uh, and, and have failed. And, and that puts it in a, a, an almost impossible position. It's a kind of spiral of decline. And you've seen, I mean, actually just in the last five years, you've seen the overall budget of the Commonwealth Secretariat. So it's three major elements, the Secretariat itself, the Commonwealth Fund for Technical Cooperation, and the Commonwealth Youth Fund. That combined budget going from over 50 million, which isn't very much to start off with, to just over 30 million. And what, what on earth can you do with... So you, you're in this vicious cycle that the, the donors don't think they're getting value for money, therefore they cut, therefore the, the Secretariat can do less. Um, um, 
So I suppose, you know, if I was making a case for the secretary, I'd say it's in an impossible position now. Um, and it, it um, if there was a bit more faith in it and a bit more willingness to put money behind it, it could do more. I don't know what Justin feels about. Um, I think I'm being inclined to agree. Now, one of the things that we haven't talked about yet is exactly what Philip just mentioned is money and the extent to which any international organisation trying to push an agenda actually mm. relies on resources. I mean, if it, if it doesn't have military heft, then it has to have some kind of economic clout. And yeah. the pursuit of a kind of cultural mission of sort of anglophonie is, is actually something I think the Commonwealth has never seriously kind of set itself to do in any no. concerted way. It has had too many diffuse and underfunded organisations, all of them trying to do slightly different things. Yeah. Um, and many of them actually trying to do good things. I, I, I should say, by the way, for the uh, in response to the question about what is good about the Commonwealth, Philip's book does actually give a shout out to a number of Commonwealth institutions which actually have done sort of valuable work in terms of bits of educational exchange and so on. Yeah. I would kind of second that. There, there, there are some things which bear the Commonwealth name, which I would definitely kind of reserve from the obloquy which uh, Philip has heaped on the institution as a whole. But the point is that isn't really the Commonwealth and the Commonwealth hasn't sort of tried to um, organize, um, coordinate or most importantly systematically fund that kind of endeavor. So if one were to see this as a, as a sort of cultural project that would certainly be possible and that hint has always been there but it's never actually been systematically pursued. That's not actually the Commonwealth has always been this kind of funny thing that people keep using for different purposes. It hasn't had that singular goal. And similar with kind of what Philip mentioned a little while ago about the voice for the smaller states. Well, yes, clearly something like the Commonwealth does have that possibility, but of course it's never really performed that, that role in a systematic way. And if you were, dare I say it, a small island state, which had had a part of its territory retained by former imperial power and leased to another major imperial mm. power, you might not have found the Commonwealth as your best advocate in, mm. circum in that circumstance. Um, so it could play that role and it's kind of has that potential it's done that a little bit but it never has significantly and the problem is at the moment other regional organizations are actually doing that perhaps more efficiently yeah. if you have a if you're a, a small west african state and you have a, a coup or a dictator to deal with then ECOWAS is probably going to be more likely to help you than the commonwealth the commonwealth is so certainly there are possibilities and i don't think I would not like to denounce every single thing that has ever been done by an organization with Commonwealth in the title. I think that would yeah. be unfair. Yeah. But I don't think there's ever been a, a kind of clear vision of what the Commonwealth is. And partly that's because it gets disputed time and time again, as Philip has said. But that's meant that it, it has several different potentials, none of which have ever been realized. And if it does have a future, then it might revolve around deciding on which of those potentials is to be realized and pursuing it slightly more systematically. But that would involve taking it more seriously in terms of funding as well. And I, think, I think that's okay, right. Like the I, think, point, yeah, I mean, you, if you're going to do this, you have to yeah, do it properly. Yeah, right. yeah. I, guess, I think that, uh, again, if you, if you Google the Commonwealth, the, the first entry you get is the Secretariat that has branded itself as the Commonwealth. And the, the secretary is not the Commonwealth. Um, the Commonwealth is something that one can redefine uh, at any given moment. The, the secretariat is a particular piece of administrative architecture that was put in place in the mid sixties and, and arguably is no longer fit for purpose. But there are, as Justin said, other, other organizations like the CPA or the ACU um, which which do serve a, a, a useful purpose, um, and as for the you know regional organisations, yeah, I mean ab absolutely, ECOWAS. You saw how effectively and ruthlessly it it um, dealt with the situation in Gambia a few years ago. Now, the Commonwealth just would never have been able to do, or it, it is not designed to do something like that. And if it had done it would have been accused of the worst sort of neo-colonialism. Um, but, but the West African states collectively can deal with something like that much more effectively. 
Okay, can we go back a bit to the questions about uh, the possibility of popular support for the, uh, or not, for the Commonwealth uh, mm. outside UK? Mike followed up his earlier question. Mm. Um, um, maybe I'll pose it to Justin because he specifically asked about an East African country. Mm. Uh, in East Africa, do, do people have any feelings about the uh, uh, Commonwealth outside the elite? In fact, are, are they aware of it as an organisation that has any importance to their lives at all? That's a, a really interesting question. I, I would hesitate to ventriloquise the population of any East African country, but right. I, I, only to a limited extent, I think, is the honest answer. Um, and I, I think in terms of kind of diplomacy and economics and everything else, I think the Commonwealth's reach actually has been sort of increasingly limited over the years. And insofar as people have a sense of a kind of international world, um, their understanding of that is shaped by the United Nations, by the regional organisations, and not by the Commonwealth. Um, mm. The Queen obviously does have considerable resonance, I think, across East Africa, as I suspect across the world. Um, so there's that, that emotive linkage still exists. But I, I don't, honestly, I, I can't claim that I do think the Commonwealth really has a very substantial claim on people's affections outside a relatively small group who may kind of have circulated within a, a sort of a, a kind of international partly Commonwealth elite. And I, I think, again, that's sort of one of the challenges of the organisation, because if, if it were to wish to reinvent itself, then actually that sort of popular claim on affections outside the United Kingdom would surely be something rather important. And I mean, the Commonwealth Games, yes, I think Philip's right. People have heard of those. But I, I don't actually think the Commonwealth in other ways strikes anybody as a sort of significant part of their, of their sort of imaginative plan of the world. Um, we did get a, we got a question um, before the meeting started from Judy Steele in Australia, who we hope is sleeping soundly at the uh, at the moment, to do with the the representation of First Peoples within the Commonwealth. I think she was um, particularly writing in from an Australian perspective, but of course there's a strong New Zealand angle there as well in thinking of representation of uh, First Peoples. I mean, do do you have would you like to comment on that one at, uh, at all, Philip? I, th I think that this has become a kind of an increasingly prominent issue. I mean, it, it, it's still far more a question for the individual states themselves than a, a Commonwealth issue as such. But I think that in, in recent years, and certainly over the last 12 months with the Black Lives Matter um, protests, and, and an increasing interest in legacies of empire more generally, there's, there's been a sense that the, the Commonwealth can no longer avoid this elephant in the room, which is the, the kind of its position within that sort of broader uh, set of legacies of colonialism in the modern, in the modern world. And so that there is, uh, even the Secretariat now, um, the Secretary General Patricia Scotland talked about this in an interview, I think last September, um, a willingness to think about the Commonwealth's role in broader discussions around reconciliation for you know, colonial era abuses and dispossessions. And, um, and actually, you know, it, you've, uh, one saw the Queen's Commonwealth Trust last year, earlier last year, uh, which Harry and Meghan are very prominent in. Harry's the president, Meghan vice president. Um, again, Harry and Meghan using a meeting with youth leaders to talk about, um, you know, leg colonial legacy issues in a way that, you know, the Commonwealth, you know, the official Commonwealth really hadn't in the past. So, I mean, go, you know, going to say that the heads of government meeting in Perth in 2011, one is struck by the way in which, you know, there is a kind of uh, a recognition of um, Aboriginal land, which, um, in which um, Aboriginal sort of spokespeople 
took part in the People's, uh, the People's Forum at the beginning of the, of the, uh, of the meeting, but it wasn't really part of the, the high level agenda of representatives of, of the states themselves. Whereas now I think it, there is a kind of a willingness to, to discuss these kinds of issues at, at heads of love, the government level. And I think that this will become, and, and actually I think this is where the Commonwealth does have a comparative advantage and, 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 and an, an area in which it is a kind of a logical forum for the discussion of, of, um, of racial inequalities and the, 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 the hangovers of, of imperial oppression. And e equally relevant to Kenya. Uh, yeah. Justin. Uh, yes, potentially so, yes. But although, again, not so far, but potentially, yes. Yeah. But I think this is, it's, it's kind of interesting, isn't it, when you, you think about Kenya, that part of the compact around the Commonwealth was a sort of mutual, a mutual um, forgetting, a mutual amnesia, which sort of served a lot of different interests. And it served a lot of different interests in Kenya Mm. under Kenyatta and Daniel Arab Moy. And it, it, it's almost when we kind of get, we, we, we get beyond the stage when there are people still around who know that they have, everyone has slightly dirty hands as a result of the mm. transfer of power. Um, that we, we start to kind of reify this, this experience of kind of colonial oppression um, uh, maybe there's something in that. Yeah. Let's move. I've got, there are a few more questions we ought to get through while we've still got uh, time. Um, one question here, will you be writing a chapter called The Road to, K to Kigali? <laughs> to the road uh, to uh, yeah. And maybe you, for, for some of the, um, some of the audience who are still with us, maybe you ought to ex explain what the uh, significance of that in relation to Chogum is. Yeah, well, the chapter about the, the chapter about Sri Lanka um, was called the Road to Colombo, um, and and it was about it, it was about actually watching a kind of slow motion car crash. That that we, you know, it's not that we were wise after the event. Um, we we were at, at the Perth Heads of Government meeting in two thousand eleven. We actually launched a pamphlet saying why the next meeting shouldn't be in in Sri Lanka. Um, because we knew it was going to be a, you know, we were really predicting that it was going to be a, 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 a disaster. And yet the kind of, that no one did anything to sort of stop, stop it happening. And one ended up with, you know, a, a very embarrassed, again, you know, trying to persuade um, major donor governments like the UK to take the Commonwealth seriously. In 2013, David Cameron, the British Prime Minister, was just placed in an unnecessarily embarrassing position by having to decide whether to go to Sri Lanka or not. And he knew he was going to be attacked, whatever he did. And he mentions in his memoirs that uh, even the Queen wasn't letting him know whether she was going or not. And he was having to sort of pick up little, little hints here and, here and there. Um, uh, but it, it, you know, it, just as the Commonwealth was launching its charter, claiming its commitment to human rights, you pass the post of chair in office to someone who is accused of complicity in, in war crimes, and it doesn't doesn't look good. Now, President Kagame is 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 no Rajapaksa. Um, you can, you know, you like him or, 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 or loathe him. He's not in that, he's not in that sort of category at all. Um, but you you have a government there that, that, that has displayed authoritarian tendencies, uh, that has clamped down very hard on opposition, and uh, where it is not easy to be a journalist and and to uh, you know, to report freely on, on what is going on. And so is this um, uh, a good way of showcasing the Commonwealth, which is supposedly 
a values-based organization committed to, to democracy and, and freedom of expression? Probably not. Um, but again, you've seen the way in which once a country is given the opportunity of hosting the heads of government meeting, it hangs on to it for dear life. And last year, it was only about two months before the meeting was due to take place in, in, in Rwanda that um, the decision was made to postpone it. And that's because, you know, the Kagame government had put lots of money into uh, getting the capital ready for the meeting, wanted to reap the benefits of it. And, and I, you can see it happening. I mean, the, the, the secretary is giving, starting to give off signs that it might hold the thing online in June, but I don't think the Rwandans want to, to lose, lose control of it. And, and Kagame definitely wants to be the next chair in office. So it, um, again, it's, it, it's, it's history repeating itself um, in a way that was probably avoidable, although maybe not, um, uh, because, you know, no state ever has completely clean hands in that respect. Do you have anything specifically to say about the road to Kigali, Justin? <laughs> no, well, no, I think you're current, very eloquent on that, so I, I, I wouldn't like to add anything. <laughs> uh, okay, maybe as well not. Um, as you're both historians, we have a, a challenging and broad uh, question, which is, um, what might we um, learn from the experience of the Commonwealth, or maybe vice versa as well, when we look at the history of uh, empires and how decolonization uh, occurs? I mean, is it, is it the least bad way to end an empire? <laughs> you're, you're the historians, I'm just an answer. Yeah, no, it, um, interesting question. Well, I've, shall, shall I have a go first, Philip? You yeah. know much more about this than me, so I'm going to embarrass myself and then you can correct me. Um, I mean, I think one of the things that Philip's book shows rather well is that this was a, con the con Commonwealth was in part a convenient device for dealing with some of the complications and embarrassments of ending an empire. I would not say that it was necessarily a kind of a model or the best way to do this, but it was certainly an effective device for handling some of those things. And it, within its particular framework, it worked quite well. The very fact that kind of a lot of things therefore got pushed under the carpet and, and can uh, sort of consigned to a, a consensual forgettery um, was part of that kind of process. Um, and that also then leads on to problems, of course, because it means that the, the organization that on the one hand is capable of collective forgetting and putting this stuff aside also therefore has real difficulties as an organization in agreeing to do anything or agreeing on what the, the forward agenda is. So I suppose you might say this has been both a kind of interesting and in some ways sort of effective model, but it's also a model whose very effectiveness kind of undermines its utility in the longer run for doing anything else, because it, it sort of that's what it began as and once it, once it had finished being that then the question became well, what else is this for? Yeah, I was very struck by the, um, uh, Philip's account of these enormously long uh, statements that came out of Chocum yes. which were were so long and so detailed that the main thing that this this fudge guaranteed was that absolutely nothing could be done with the resources at hand because there were so many aims announced but uh, which seems consistent with what you're saying Justin so um but I think we might close after this one because I can't imagine we're going to get a bigger question than this one. And I think I think that the, the 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 those long communicates again. It's about the sort of corporatist nature of civil site engagement that the the Commonwealth Boxing Association wants a resolution on boxing and the Chess Association wants a resolution on chess, and that there's a very kind of at worst there's a very inward looking process-based focus that so long as you can get a, a mention in a resolution you've somehow done something. Um, I think the you know you often hear it said by the people who defend Britain's imperial record well it can't have been that bad 
uh, because all of these countries wanted to remain in the in the Commonwealth. Uh, we can't have been that awful. And it, 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 it is a very useful kind of rhetorical device for the British in their diplomatic relation. It's like having a good divorce. You know, I can't have been that mean to my wife because we're still the best of friends. Um, and it, it's not, I mean, it's not quite that simple. Um, because the, the, you know, the, I, I think that, the, as I said, the, there's, a, there's a way in which member states remained in the Commonwealth because they saw the Commonwealth as something different from empire, and something, a new organization that was very much, that had the center of gravity within the, the, the global South, the developing world. Um, and it wasn't, it's really important to, to remember that it wasn't designed by the British, really. Mm. Um, the British aren't all that happy about India remaining, they're ambivalent about India remaining in the Commonwealth as a republic in, in, in 49. They're, they're not keen about, terribly keen about Ghana joining in 57. They're pretty appalled by the idea of Cyprus joining in 1960. Um, they're not even very keen about Mozambique as a non-former British territory joining in 1995. And, and so there's a kind of, that, that's partly the strength of the Commonwealth, that it, it, is, it is led by custom and demand. And it must therefore have been offering something um, to, to those members who wanted to, to join. And I think it was, it was seen as a way of, of pushing a, a global South agenda on, as, as you said, a sort of, you know, a, a member of the, the Security Council um, and trying to get their voices heard. So again, that's, I think, very much a point in, in, in the, the Commonwealth's favour and something that could be built upon. I have had, I don't know whether, how much general interest there would be in these, uh, Philip, but I've had a couple to do with the Institute of Commonwealth Studies mm -hmm. rather than with your yeah. uh, book. Um, um, and they, they, they take this form. The first one was, well, well, how, how would you tell your own bosses that the Institute of Commonwealth Studies was worth retaining at a time when you've written a book saying it's a myth? And the second one was, what do you think the Institute of Commonwealth Studies has got to contribute uh, towards um, but thinking about Britain's position in a post-Brexit world. Well, the kind of the second, the second, uh, the second question sort of answers the first question, right? Yeah. In, in a way, I mean the, um, uh, and I, I, you know, sometimes saying in re relation to the first question that you know there were there were plenty of heads of Soviet studies departments mm -hmm. in. British universities in the 70s and 80s who weren't seeing the red flag to themselves in the, the bath every night. Um, it, it, I, I think that in the way in which Britain negotiates both the Commonwealth relationship, its Commonwealth relationships and imperial legacy issues, you, you need a kind of historical understanding uh, of those relationships. Um, and, and the way in which the Commonwealth failed so often in the past is to treat every year as the year zero when the past is going to be forgotten and a brave new future is going to be achieved. And, you know, from the time of its first director, Keith, Keith Hancock, in 1949, and, and through, you know, our real kind of glory days in the 80s under Shula Marx, um, the Institute has largely been led by historians and it's, it's, its interest and its understanding has been historically informed. And I think unless you, unless you kind of bring a historical understanding um, to bear on Britain's post-colonial relationships, you're, you're gonna come a cropper sooner or later. So I think as, as a unique focus of expertise, whatever we say, and there isn't a collective position on anything. We're a platform on which a wide variety of views are expressed. And um, heaven knows, we, we really do believe in 
in academic freedom of speech. We don't need a, a new commissioner to, to, to force us to do that. We, 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 we uh, encourage a, a, a wide variety of voices to express themselves. And uh, I think we still have tremendous value. Thank you. On that note, can I encourage those who would uh, wish to do so, have a look in the uh, chat. I believe the website of the Institute of Commonwealth Studies is there. If it yep. isn't there, you'll find it very easily by uh, Googling. There was uh, certainly always has been, in my experience, a very active and full seminar program encouraging us, encouraging us to think yes. historically about yep. the place of the Commonwealth and of Britain uh, in the world and understanding current debates with more nuance than we might uh, otherwise do. So um, thank you, uh, Philip. Thank you, Justin. Uh, thank all of you for being uh, with us uh, this afternoon and now evening uh, as it darkens. Um, and I hope you will look at the forthcoming uh, Reviewers Meet Reviewed, as well as other events coming up through the RAI and uh, support those as well. So uh, enjoy the rest of the evening and thank you very much all of you for joining us. Bye bye. <laughs>